Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Iran's Air Force has not been able to sustain whatever level it's had until the 1970s. Under the Islamic Republic, its planes are poorly maintained and its pilots have not demonstrated any proficiency. The solution is the ubiquitous unmanned aerial systems, operated by Iranians and proxies alike, from Iran itself to Iraq, Yemen, Syria, Lebanon and Gaza. Used against stationary or slow-moving land and maritime targets, drones enable the Iranians to deliver munitions from afar without losing aircrew and with them deniability. Last month, Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz listed 16 such attacks over the last couple of years alone. How effective is this weapon and how are Israel and its partners countering it? Joining us from northern Israel to deliberate this issue is retired Brigadier General Relik Shafir, who is a former IAF or Israel Air Force commander. Thank you for joining us, sir. My pleasure. Also joining us from Washington, D.C. is the retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett, who is a former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs. Thank you for joining us as well, sir. Thank you, Jonathan. Indeed, and with me here in the studio is our TV7 editor-at-large and host of both Watchmen Talk and Powers in Play, Mr. Amir Oren. Amir, give us a broader understanding on this challenge that has already surfaced several years back, but is now becoming more of an issue for most Western partners here in the region? Well, Jonathan, one only has to look at the uh, distinguished careers of our co-panelists to uh, find out how uh, warfare changed. General Kimmett is a distinguished artillery officer, which, of course, um, is supposed to bring firepower to the enemy without close combat, uh, which endangers your own troops. Of course, uh, there is also counter-battery fire and so on and so forth. But Anyway, artillery was supposed to be the queen of battle um, in times past. And uh, General Relik Shafir, um, a former fighter pilot who, uh, among other exploits, took part in the bombing of Osirak, the uh, Iraqi uh, nuclear reactor. And now um, their successors are um, endangered species because if you can send such a chip device uh, off the shelf uh, sometimes uh, commercially um, or use it the way Amazon and other companies do to deliver munitions, not to bomb, but to deliver them to a terror squad, as was the case three and a half years ago uh, when the Iranians tried it via Jordan to the Palestinians, then perhaps you can um, uh, make uh, the uh, other forces redundant. Now, as you say, this is a poor man's air force. And um, this goes uh, to show that Israel's enemies and the West's enemies have learned uh, from the uh, total dominance of American, Israeli, British, Australian, and what have you, air forces uh, over the battlefield that they should concentrate on surface-to-air missiles, surface-to-surface -surface missiles, perhaps cruise missiles, and now, apparently, drones or the entire family of drones. Which turns, of course, statistic arsenals into precision-guided munitions quite easily uh, integrated into various uh, battlefields. But I'd like to start with you, General Sh uh, Shafir. Israel has been contending with this uh, challenge for quite some time, but also has been utilizing uh, unmanned aerial systems for its own purposes, as do most uh, uh, powers in the region and uh, most notably also the United States and other Western powers. How do you see uh, Jerusalem contend with this new reality in which the enemies of uh, the state of Israel, as well as of our regional partners and allies and our strategic partner uh, to the West in the United States, on a regular basis here throughout this region? Well, we... Um I think this is something expected because uh, carrying out missions with drones um, is not a difficult task, but carrying out them out successfully against uh, um, EW, electronic warfare, uh, jamming and so on is more difficult. I would uh, venture to say that during peacetime as we are now, if you can call it peacetime, um, probably not a lot of jamming would take place. 
uh, not to give away um, discreet uh, tactics, but this is an ongoing and increasing threat uh, on a local level because of the ability to deliver munition and may require uh, a, a, some kind of a counteroffensive in, in that uh, when the drones are up in the air, there could be counter drones that can shoot them down, can jam them, uh, can even uh, take them as hostages by uh, um, taking over their command and control systems because the original command and control is far behind when they approach uh, the territory or our territory or wherever we want to be. And um, so it may be a battle of command systems and who can take who. So I'm just trying to put forward uh, some things that the imagination uh, can carry through that this is not a uh, system that ha doesn't have fallibilities. Uh, the most important of which is when wartime comes, uh, there'll be so much uh, electronic warfare in the air and jamming, GPS jamming, uh, command control systems, etc., etc., that these systems have not been tested in real combat situations. So this is something that remains to be seen. Um, I think I'll uh, stay with that at this point in time. Indeed. General Kimmel, I'd like to hear your take on this also from the American perspective, considering that the United States also as early as 2014 had to contend with uh, the Islamic State, Daesh, which uh, utilized drones that you could just buy off the Internet and then uh, carry a payload of up to five kilograms, something that, uh, of course, was then utilized in the battlefield to try and uh, surprise coalition forces operating in the field. What did the United States undergo in order to contend with that issue, and, and was it successful thus far? The use of drones is not something new. Obviously, we've been using uh, drones for many, many years in our operations against uh, uh, terrorist groups. But what distinguishes these recent drones and these recent UASs that we're seeing is the fact that they fly low and they fly slow. All of our countermeasures, all of our defensive systems right now are set up uh, to aim up, to shoot up our CRAM weapon system, which is a phalanx ground system, fires directly up in the air. Uh, but when you now have drones that can actually hug the earth, stay behind buildings, stay at a ground level, uh, especially in populated areas, you can't use systems such as CRAM. So as my colleague uh, from Northern Israel said, we're going to have to start depending on other systems uh, like jamming, like um, <clears throat> electromagnetic warfare to try to bring these down. But there is a current vulnerability that we're seeing most recently in the assassination attempt against the Iraqi prime minister, where these low and slow, uh, lightly armored, lightly light payload UASs are in many ways creating some level of havoc on the battlefield. Indeed. Mr. Owen. Well, uh, two, two points. Uh, one is that uh, the single uh, drone is not much of a threat, but a swarm of uh, such mosquitoes may sometimes, um, if uh, aimed at the right target from their point of view, can cause much more destruction than um, a bird of prey because um, the earlier uh, drones, the UAVs, which the Americans uh, used, were called predator, predator and raptor. But actually, these are only mosquitoes. Uh, they they uh, can cause uh, some problems. They can sting you. They cannot uh, have a decisive effect. However, um, because the Hamas, for instance, or Hezbollah, may wait for Israeli ground forces to enter their urban areas. If they try to aim uh, an explosive-laden drone into, for instance, an armored personnel carrier, in order to cause casualties, because they understand that this is the soft underbelly of Israeli society, it will not decide the battle. But if an APC is 
being bombed by such a kamikaze drone, it can have an effect. Indeed. Nevertheless, when we're looking at the current situation, and this is something that uh, you all touched base on, but I, I'd like to hear your take on this, General Shafir. Uh, as this threat is not a new threat, why now? Of course, we hear the uh, operational advantages that the new drones, uh, which were introduced by the Islamic Re uh, Republic of Iran, the Shia 3, and uh, the various uh, uh, components thereof, uh, why now is this brought to the forefront as a emerging challenge and uh, to what degree is it actually a threat to freedom of operation of uh, all Western forces? I think uh, the change took place in the uh, Azerbaijan-Armenian conflict uh, last year that brought forward the decisiveness of using uh, different types of drones by the Azeris, it's not that the Armenians did not know uh, that such drones existed. They didn't understand the effects that it would have on the battlefront and the drone's ability to quickly take out air defenses and to quickly immobilize uh, their tanks, etc., and APCs. So this was a, a wake-up call to all those who uh, knew but did not understand the effects of uh, these type of weapons. So the Iranian use is uh, follows the acknowledgement that this is a, a forceful entry into the battlefield, uh, creating a new kind of uh, understanding both of the swarms of drones, as, uh, as alluded to, and the regular drones um, and the self-explosive drones, etc. So these are becoming more and more effective at the battlefront and cause a real um, uh, effect on decision making. So uh, this is, I think, uh, the awakening and not just the Iranian ones. Indeed. Uh, I'd like also to hear your take on this, uh, General Kemet, but also if you may, in the maritime sphere, we saw, of course, the attack uh, a couple of months ago against Mercer Street, we saw the various uh, uh, strike or the utilization of uh, those UAS systems uh, from uh, the, the Houthi militia in Yemen towards Saudi Arabia against the Aramco installations and their growing threats being uh, uh, proclaimed, at least on several uh, releases in the area of the Red Sea, all the uh, use of such UAS systems. Uh, in order to uh, threaten maritime, uh, the maritime domain and maritime shipping. What is the current process undertaken and to what degree is there capacity to deal with this threat considering what you mentioned earlier? You're talking about are sort of the medium to large uh, types of UASs. Move fast, move uh, high in the air, can be detected by radar systems, uh, can be brought down by conventional uh, systems such as Phalanx uh, and CRAM. Uh, but I, I repeat that I think the greatest danger in what has brought this to the fore is not the use of medium and high uh, altitude uh, units such as Mosquito, uh, such as the Predator uh, and the, and the uh, other systems that we have, but it's these very small uh, UASs that we're starting to see that can really be owned by any group. Uh, the danger is not the types of drones you see in conventional forces, nation state forces. The real danger is the ability for any group that has a name, has a purpose, has a mission, to call up Amazon, get a couple of dozens of these, and they now have gone from being a militia to a very, very lethal cap uh, force with a very lethal capability. So what we've really done is we've taken high technology uh, drone system that cost billions and billions of dollars to develop uh, that we use successfully in terrorist operations um, for years and years and put them in the hands of militia groups who can go to Walmart, pick these up, attach a hand grenade to them and can be used uh, in missions such as attempting to assassinate the prime minister of Iraq. That's what's really uh, changed from before, because uh, these are low, they're slow, they're number one, hard to detect by radar systems, 
And when they're used in a swarm tactic, hard to bring down with conventional systems, particularly in populated areas. Mr. Owen, I'd like to hear your take on this as well. And this has been also a philosophical discussion behind this because there was the utilization of artificial intelligence into those drone swarms that you referred to earlier and uh, may perpetrate massive damage based on specific algorithms, something that the Chinese are already developing. Russia seems to be also uh, uh, at a head start with this, and the United States is also deliberating the advancement of such a system with, of course, uh, legal backing that will allow it to utilize this in the battlefield. To what degree is this now the, the futuristic battlefield that uh, we have been hearing about for the past 10 years? So let me make uh, several points. First of all, regarding the maritime domain, um, it can embolden uh, the IRGC and other groups to believe that they have found the substitute to aircraft carriers. Now, whether this uh, will uh, be realized on the battlefield or not um, it is not that important. Regardless of the uh, reality, they may feel too cocky and then start something which will escalate because of their belief that uh, they found uh, uh, the solution. Now, um, earlier, even in this uh, century, uh, air forces uh, tried to go for the uh, mostest, the fastest and the mostest, as was said during the American uh, Civil War. The, uh, uh, the heavier the uh, munition was, the better. But of course, we found out that it's the other way around. One has to minimize the precision guided munition in order to shoot it right into the uh, uh, window or whatever small target you need. And a drone is good for that. And the last point is that um, we all agree that qualitatively, the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Navy, of course, and the U.S. Army with this, with its aviation, as long as the, um, uh, the Israeli Air Force and other Western Air Forces are uh, of better quality than their adversaries. This dominance will grow, will not diminish, when Air Forces are um, getting used to flying formations of, let's say, a four-ship formation led by a manned fighter with three wingmen without men, three UAVs, UASs. And um, uh, in that, Israel, as well as other countries, uh, are much, much better uh, equipped technologically, creatively, and this is the future. Indeed. However, when uh, I hear General Kim speak about those uh, mosquito drones, uh, so cold mosquito drones. Uh, I'd like to ask you, General Shafil, to what degree is Israel actually contending with its threat at this stage, uh, considering the fact that uh, we saw the Islamist Hamas organization utilize this, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad utilize this uh, 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 type of warfare, if you will, as well as Hezbollah have been working quite tirelessly. Already we saw reports from 2011 and before that of uh, their recruitment of young teenagers who play computer games in order to try and, and draw them into uh, the, the new age of warfare, so to speak, uh, utilizing those drones for uh, the battlefield? Uh, let me answer this uh, in another way. If I were an investor, I would put my money in companies that uh, deploy electronic countermeasures, jamming, uh, hoisting, uh, and uh, these different types of uh, discrete um, warfare where the other side doesn't even know that uh, it's been uh, uh, hijacked or jammed uh, or some of the systems are jammed. So I think uh, that is probably the way uh, to think about it. General Kimmett? I see that inside warfare, there is always this action, reaction, counteraction in terms of the development of weapon systems. I agree with the general that that's a good place to start. Uh, but before too long, we can accept we can expect that uh, drones will have uh, anti-jamming capabilities. They'll have they will be more hardened to prevent takeover. 
So I think this is just something that we not only have to um, recognize that we need to keep up with the technology of our adversaries, but we always need to be a step ahead of our adversaries. So if they have that capability, we take that capability away from them and then we develop a capability that they can't take away from us. But that's the constant evolution you see on the battlefield. We've seen it uh, for 10,000 years, and we would just expect that drones are going to be another in that evolutionary series of weapons development uh, by new names and by new capabilities. Mr. Uh, General Kimmitt uh, used the uh, term evolutionary, but I would like to uh, bring back the term revolution. Um, late uh, in the 20th uh, century, the buzzword or buzzwords were a revolution in military affairs, uh, which started in the uh, Soviet Union, but was also studied in the West. And what we see now is that several dimensions of warfare have come to the fore, cyber, space, um, what are you going to do when your GPS uh, is jammed? And also drones, because the ground commander, the battalion commander or brigade commander, must now think in 360 degrees at all time. He cannot be sure that someone is watching over him and uh, will give him uh, close air support. Uh, he can be attacked uh, just across the hill. Of course, the battalion commander in the Israeli army also has his own drones in order to see uh, from top of the hill. But uh, warfare has changed to such an extent that, yes, drones are a component, but not necessarily the uh, most important one. And uh, General Shafil, would you uh, concur with that statement? Well, most definitely. Um, I think the... Uh, most important thing is to understand that information gathered by uh, either drones or F-35 uh, radar uh, and interconnection, interactivities between the different forms of the military uh, or paramilitary forces where the information flows into decision makers who can make quick decisions on what to do and when. Uh, is not just a buzzword, but it's an actuality on the ground. I would also add that um, political leaders, but not not only political leaders, um, maybe managers of large corporations, uh, are also prone to being attacked by uh, these mosquitoes. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised that part of and parcel of their... Uh, defense system is not just bodyguards, but also systems that will allow them to evade uh, being attacked by these mosquitoes. So yes, it is a revolution. Um, it's kind of hard to think of what will happen in the next uh, step, but well, we're right in the middle of it. But not only officials, also mass public events uh, in big stadiums and other venues uh, could serve as targets for terrorist attacks by drones. Indeed, there is a lack of preparedness at this stage, but General Kimmett, do you think that uh, uh, investments would be uh, redirected in order to contend with this challenge? Of course, we can only imagine the horrors that could accumulate uh, from ter those terror organizations actually utilizing this for uh, various uh, uh, avenues or, or other scenes that, that at this stage, um, there are systems, but not enough out there to contend with this. No, I think that's right. I can tell you that billions of dollars are being invested by private industry in the United States and with our coalition partners because we recognize what a threat this has been. We haven't come up with the silver bullet for the counter drone technology, but I think we're getting there. But of course, then somebody will develop another way to uh, go around that. I would take make a point, though. I don't necessarily think that we are seeing a revolution in military affairs. Uh, uh, to me, a revolution in military affairs happens when the fundamental principles of war change. Uh, I don't think we're seeing that on the battlefield right now. I think we're seeing evolving technology that just adapts capabilities such as information uh, to existing principles of fighting. I remember as a young officer, we used to talk about the OODA loop, the observe, orient, 
decide and act. And that, in many ways, is what we're still trying to do. Uh, I know that people have uh, talked about the end of artillery, but we, in fact, are now increasing the artillery in the United States to, to take care of much more long-range, much more precision-guided artillery. So uh, I would simply say that, uh, yes, we are developing the capabilities. Yes, billions of dollars are being spent in counter-drone um, capabilities. And uh, I think after 20 years of war that we've seen in Iraq and Afghanistan, we've seen a lot of changes. We've seen a lot of evolution. But candidly, I don't think we've seen anything revolutionary uh, and nor do I see that either in anticipated operations in the Indo-Pacific theater or in the European theater. Amir, you have 30 seconds for a closing statement. Yeah, just to emphasize Mark Kimmett's uh, point, uh, we are talking about uh, smart weapons, smart toys, smartphones, but it's the human behind it. As Marshall McLuhan, the communications uh, professor, used to say, these are the extensions of man. Man creates it. Man can create the counter technology. So eventually, the uh, whatever wisdom and creativity there is uh, are all in one's brain and not in one's drone. Indeed. Well, this is all the time that we have for today. So I'd like to thank General Shafil and General Kimmett for being part of today's panel. I'd like also to thank our TV7 editor at large, Mr. Amir Oren, as well as our viewers, and we will see you next time. TV7's productions and editorials, we invite you to visit our website at www.tv7israelnews.com.